Okay, great. So I asked you guys to calculate this and I did it wrong myself. Fantastic. So it's uh, answer is 2.75 uh, times 10 to the power minus something at the moment. All right. So on the on my slide it says five point something, which is which is wrong. So uh, I did something wrong. So I can make mistakes too. So okay, uh, let's uh, let's continue. So uh, so the next question is. So we know now a little bit about how monomers swell, um, that there's a certain rate involved, um, and that it's important that the rate of you know, monomer entry is higher than the rate of consumption in a way, otherwise you end up in diffusion control uh, systems. So an interesting thing is what you observe is if you would do an emulsion polymerization, then it's way faster than an equivalent bulk polymerization. So an emulsion polymerization of styrene typically takes like three to four hours. And a bulk polymerization takes one day, two days. So, and the reason uh, for that is depicted in uh, this uh, simplified uh, image. So, imagine there's five radicals. Uh, they're orange dots in this case. So, in a bulk system, these five <laughs> radicals, they can find each other and undergo biomolecular termination. So, two radicals react with each other either via combination or disproportionation. So the total number of radicals active in your system will be reduced by termination. Now, imagine now that all these radicals are in a different particle. So the picture on the right. If they're in a different particle, they can't see each other, which means that the average radical concentration is higher because these radicals can't terminate. So basically, we're in a compartmentalized system. So, and that is the reason why the reaction rates um, are way higher. So every, every particle operates at its own reaction vessel. And because there are so many particles, and because you know, whatever is in one particle, the other particle doesn't know about, you can artificially get a way greater concentration of overall number of radicals in an emulsion polymerization which is the reason why these reactions are way faster. It's also the reason why these reactions typically get way higher molecular weights than the equivalent bulk polymerization. And in bulk polymerization, the molecular weights, um, the limiting factor there at high radical fluxes at least is termination. Because termination is suppressed by compartmentalization here, suppressed in one particle, that is, because the total amount of radicals is less, you'll get also higher molecular weight. So this is a very important thing for reactions taking place in small systems, that you have lots and lots of lots of different reactors in a way. Okay, so, um, so now you can ask yourself the question, how many radicals are there in every particle, in, in one particle? And uh, I talked about it a little bit before already. We had this little value called n bar, which is the average number of radicals per particle. And, uh, and the simplest way of thinking about this, and the classical way of thinking about this, is the system of zero one kinetics. And zero one kinetics means there's either zero radical or one radical in a particle. So imagine I have a radical propagating in the water phase that wants to enter my particle when it becomes Zetner in a way, and my particle is empty, there's no radical in there, and I enter, and then I've got one, yeah? Now, a little bit later in time, a second radical wants to do the same thing. That other radical that was in there already is happily propagating, yeah, it's becoming longer and longer and longer, and now the second one comes in, but it's, it's a relatively short molecule. And you know that radical termination in free radical polymerization is diffusion control. So when that little thing comes in, it might find the other one instantaneously and terminate. So you have zero radicals as a result. Yeah? So you either have one or you have zero. And statistically over time, it's zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, yeah? And it just goes up and down like that. So the average, by definition, is a half. Yeah. So in zero one kinetics, n bar 
is a half. So, so I've, I've made a plot of n bar versus um, the ratio of n3, which here is, um, is, is, is described by rho, and, and k is something we haven't talked about yet. k is exit. So if a radical can enter a particle, maybe a radical can also exit a particle. Yeah? And exit, that those type of radicals are normally uh, made via chain transfer to monomer. So I've got a propagating radical in a particle. I undergo chain transfer, in this case chain transfer to monomer. So I end up with a monomeric radical. Styrene dissolves a bit in water so it can desorb from a particle. So a monomeric radical that's styrene based can also desorb from a particle. And that event is called exit. Now exit acts like a drain. Yeah. So you can imagine if the ratio of entry over exit is really high, effectively I have no exit, <coughs> that I end up with this number a half. However, if exit is really high, so let's say I just only have exit, yeah, only transfer, then basically that ratio becomes to zero and m bar drops to zero. So it's kind of a sigmoidal plot with a maximum a half, minimum value is obviously zero. So exit, drops the theoretical value from a zero one system to lower numbers. Acts like a drain, basically. So displayed here, so radical exit, um, as a result of that, you know, the, a radical can leave a particle, it can undergo termination there, but it can also re-enter a particle. But typically if you leave a particle, you basically can react with water soluble radicals. So you drop the average amount uh, within a particle. So, so now the last question that you can ask yourself is like, okay, what if my particle is big? So I've got a propagating radical, which is on the left-hand side of my particle, but I enter on the other side of my particle. It can't see that there's a radical in there because the volume is too large. And as a result of that, I do not have instantaneous termination. And I as a result of that, I can have more than one radical in a particle, so n bar becomes larger than 0 0.5. And slowly but surely, if my particle is bigger or bigger or bigger, it just starts to look like a block polymerization, where compartmentalization is no longer. So if I make my particle a micron, above a micron, effectively it's a block polymerization, roughly. Yeah? So below that, this effect of compartmentalization kicks in. So this is why we call the system that exceeds 0 0.5 as a value for n bar a pseudo bulk system. Yeah? The larger the particle, the more it tends to look like a bulk polymerization. Okay, so that effectively sums up stage two. So what is stage three? Well, stage three is very simple. It's like, I no longer have monomer droplets present, so I keep on reacting, and as a result of that, my monomer concentration drops in my particle. I can still get some from the water phase, but the water phase drops below its saturated value now, and slowly but surely, you run out of monomer. So you slow down your complete reaction, and typical overall conversions are really high. 98% is quite normal, which is very high for a, and the last bit you can strip out if you want to. So um, the only thing which sometimes can uh, do something weird to the graph over there is uh, something which you hopefully know in, uh, from, from polymer chemistry is that the tromsdorf norrish effect can kick in or the gel effect. So the gel effect basically means that the viscosity inside the particle becomes high so that fast reactions really become the fusion controls. Yeah, they slow, in a way, they slow down a lot. So in, initially, that would be termination. Yeah? It basically means that N bar will go higher because you no longer have instantaneous termination anymore. Yeah? And if N bar goes up, it means the rate goes up. So the same effect happens in a, in a bulk polymerization. Okay. So uh, the last question, uh, which I... Uh, 
which, uh, well, it's kind of a, a kind of homework question, and hopefully I got it right this time with my maths. So, uh, so in this case, we have a particle of a diameter of 100 nanometer, which is made from a polymer with a density of 1.15 grams per milliliter, um, with chains of an average molecular weight of 300,000 grams per mole. The question is, how many chains are there in the particle? So how many chains are there in one particle? So have a little think about that. So it's playing with units. So you have a, a particle of a diameter of 100 nanometer. Polymer in there, the density is 1.15 grams per milliliter. The average weight of all the chains is 300,000 grams per mole. How many chains? It's just, it's just to give you a little bit of a feeling of, you know, if I have a part, this, these are realistic numbers. How many polymer chains are cropped up in a, in a, in a 100 nanometer object? Obviously, um, okay, I'll, I'll give you the answer and you can uh, back calculate it at home. And if it's wrong, you can tell me and then I'll, uh, I'll have to correct it. So, uh, so the mass of the particle you get by multiplying the density with the volume. And if you've got that, uh, you divide that by the molecular weight and multiply with the number of Avogadro. And then you'll end up with 1,209 polymer chains. It's quite a lot, yeah? 1,200 chains in a tiny little object. And they're, they're pretty big, chunky molecules. So they're like kind of wrapped up like pot noodle in a way, yeah? So obviously, if you, if you cross-link this, yeah, if crossing density is high enough, you end up with one molecule because they're all interconnected with each other. So think about that. Okay.